All right. Well, hello, everyone. Good morning. And um, welcome to our Fridays with Fiscal for AP invoices. Um, this is going to be for tips and tricks related to AP invoices. So um, kind of just uh, made a group of um, the different things I could think about related to common questions we get or um, things that are relevant and maybe even just taking a deeper look at how some of these things work when it comes to AP invoices uh, just to kind of help see what the system's doing. Um, so as always, we are here on the main page of the wiki. Uh, just wanna point out the relevant pages to this. And uh, let's see. Okay, um, and also, you know, before I jump in, so I see we still have some people coming in in the waiting room. So I'm trying to make sure everybody gets in here. And then I do have the chat open. So um, we're gonna hop around. Um, first, we're kind of looking at you know, some of the main processing, but then I have a couple of different subjects to hop to. If you have any questions along the way, feel free to chime in or um, I have the chat right next to my notes. So um, feel free to put questions in the chat as well. Oops. <clears throat> okay, sorry. All right, getting everyone in here. Okay, so in the wiki, um, the pages that I want to point out related to invoice processing, um, I'm going under the USASR documentation. And um, let's go first to our appendix. If I go to our FAQs, I do have a section here. I can jump right to the frequently asked questions for invoices. And I have um, a lot of different questions here and um, common answers um, that come up. So this is a good place to look. If you have certain um, questions, you might wanna see if they're out here. Uh, again, these are things we actually went through, um, the tickets that we had, and we do um, try to regularly update this if something else starts coming up. Um, but when um, I created this out here, I actually went through the tickets that you all put in coming right from the districts and tried to just clarify things a bit more because those documentation pages um, for like a specific page are kind of specific to functions um, of like, you know, what does this button do? Um, how do I create where these can kind of put together some more information that might be related to specific processes. So I think this might be super helpful. Um, this is worth taking a look at. Uh, how can an invoice be changed from partial to full and full to partial? This is the first thing we're actually gonna talk about, even though I'm sure you know the button that's there, but um, I just wanna talk through like how that works and what that does. Um, but we're gonna also see that on our uh, main page as well, our um, wiki page for invoices as well. So going back, let's start fresh at USAS documentation, USSR documentation. And if I go to transactions, AP invoices, I do also have a section here to reopen or close like a partially paid or completely paid um, invoice purchase order item. So with that said, uh, let me go ahead and hop over to our software here. And okay, so let's see. So um, let me just make sure I'm hitting my notes before we jump in to start processing. <laughs> um, yeah, so the first thing when we're talking about reopening or closing um, invoices, we'll look at this and I'm specifically gonna look at this in the context of um, one that's of an invoice that's dated in a prior period. And basically we've gotten a lot of questions on this. I'm sure you all have because it works differently than classic. Um, in classic, you had that magic little program ver invoice that could just go change status and it had, you know, no worries and um, basically like no consequences. So that was allowed. Um, but what we're looking at in redesign and like probably to me, the main reason that I would describe this as a difference is because this system accounts for the ability to retroactively run reports. When you were in classic, it didn't matter if that status was changed in the current database on an invoice um, from partial to full, because the only purchase order reports, the only 
budget summary reports, the reports that had encumbrance totals on them, you could only go back to that monthly CD copy or any manual copies that were saved. You were never going back and being able to run reports with encumbrance totals for a prior period. And so the benefit of this system being able to do that is pretty big. Um, but in order to maintain appropriate figures on those reports, um, some of these processing items do have to be a little bit more strict in how it works with like needing to have the posting period open because if a change that a user is making would actually impact those totals, then the step of needing to open the posting period kind of like lets them know, hey, this is changing something that would impact you know, previous totals on reports. And so um, I know that that's like, you know, it's, it's something to adjust to when they're coming over from Classic, um, even along the way. And um, so what I wanna do is kind of look at, um, we're gonna look at the different things that are being updated when the status changes to kind of get an idea. Um, now there is, um, let me just make sure. So, um, there is an option to reopen the period and to make these changes when they're necessary. So that's the other reason I want to talk about this is not strictly saying, oh yeah, they shouldn't do this. It's showing you what, what it does so that when it comes to a situation where they may need to do something that impacts um, an invoice uh, status from a prior period, you can help them decide. Okay, so let's go to, um, let's first, I'm just going to go ahead. We're going to like take a little look around this transaction so we can get an idea of um, where it's at. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna open like three different windows. Um, and this is just all gonna be my instance, but I don't wanna have to like hop back and forth pages. So, um, and like reload them. So this page is gonna be for my transaction. So we're on the purchase orders page here. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and queue one up that shows our accounts, um, and we're going to be looking at expenditure accounts related to a purchase order. And then we'll wait on the third one. But okay. So let's go look at this PO. So this purchase order, um, first one we're going to look at is in May. Oh, I know what we can look at in our third one. Um, okay, so this one's in May. May 1st is our purchase order date. And then um, we have, this is still invoiceable. It was $100 um, was our original um, remain or original encumbrance, our PO total. So far, we've paid $20 on this, and we have $80 remaining. So let's go um, switch into our third tab. And where I wanna look at this is the activity ledger. This is really handy for just kind of giving us a full overview of um, where this is at um, and all the transactions related to this purchase order so far. Um, I like to go ahead and sort it by date. So um, let's see. And uh, this is 100% a uh, test transaction because <laughs> I put my disbursement in February <laughs> unintentionally, but um, that's okay. We'll get to the February one later. Um, okay, so here's our purchase order on this row here. And then we can see that we did have one invoice and um, disbursement. And I have my activity ledger grid um, a little bit customized here. So um, I took off some of these uh, user fields that default. And the main thing that I wanna point out that I added is the status. Now, uh, so that is that one is the one that's gonna show me like my partial or full. Uh, that comes in handy when you're migrating. So um, you all may be used to having that on there, but um, I just wanna point out that the status field is what I'm seeing over here. And so this purchase order that I'm looking at, um, boom, back to my purchase order. I can see my total paid of $20. Here it was invoice. Here it was the disbursement. Uh, let's pretend that disbursement date is in June because um, it won't necessarily matter. I don't believe for what we're doing. Um, so, so it's paid for $20 already, right? Now, uh, let's go look at the account associated with this. So that is...
Okay, so that's this account. So I picked an account for an example where I know already that uh, this PO that we're looking at is the only encumbrance related to this. So we can very easily see um, what this encumbered amount is looking like here. So here's my $80 that is consistent with the remaining amount on my purchase order. All right. So then um, the other thing I want to do is go check my posting periods. So let's just see where we're at here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close February. Um, and again, I'm so sorry that my disbursement is dated in February. Our next example, we're going to use February. So we're going to close that. Um, but I do have April, May, and June open. So May is open right now. Um, June is open right now. I believe my invoice is actually dated in June, which is the current month. So um, basically what we're looking at first is an example of doing this when um, with an open, with like a current period. So, okay, so here's my account. So now uh, let me go back to my transaction window and I'm gonna switch to our AP invoices. And let's go find our invoice that's associated with this PO. So now it was partial. So $80 at $100, it's still out there. That PO is still open. Um, in order to close, so first, so we're looking at this like close a partially paid, um, close a partially paid PO situation. Um, when I do that view with the eye icon, I can see that I have this action option over here. Now I know, um, especially when you first get in here, this can be a little bit confusing because the button says full, but um, how I like to think about this is the column header is action. What action do I wanna take? And I can see my current status is partial. So if I want to take the action of making it full, I can go ahead and click this button. That changes my item status to full. Again, my invoice is actually in the current um, month, so in my current posting period, so I'm allowed to change it. And um, now this um, invoice is full, so it closed the purchase order. So let's go back. We'll just look at our purchase order real quick. And I can see, okay, $100 was my original, but when I paid it with 20, I closed it out after that. So I have zero remaining. I'm gonna hop back to our accounts and uh, go ahead and refresh this so that we can get the updated information. And now I can see on this account that I have $0 remaining encumbrance. Again, in the current period, this all makes sense. This would reflect on um, a budget summary report is gonna come directly from this information. So um, this would include you know, the encumbered amount based on that invoice. Um, my, my purchase order uh, detail report would be based on on this. So those are the things that that um, like status change just on the invoice item is going to impact. Um, so let's see. Okay, so let's look at one that's a bit different here. Come back here. Okay, so this one, oops, wrong button. Um, so this one, my purchase order is dated in February. And remember, we closed February, so February is closed. This one's for $2,000, and um, it's a closed invoice. It's not invoiceable. So it was originally for $2,000, but we paid it for $1,200, and then it's closed. Let's hop over here. Uh, this is where I want to go to my activity ledger. And let's see, you know, what's going on related to this purchase order. Okay, so I have purchase order, oops, um, purchase order invoice disbursement. So I can see all in February, um, I went ahead, I had the original PO, 
it was invoiced in full, and then a disbursement. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. If I go to, uh, let's go to our account and check this account out. We're just doing our whole round here. Again, I chose one where this is the only purchase order that I have impacting the encumbrances on this account just to make it easy for us to see. So encumbered amount, zero, that's consistent with uh, what we were seeing on um, that purchase order. And then just for good measure, let's also go run a couple reports so that we can compare. This is going to run for June. Okay. Because this we can leave open. So this kind of helps us out. Okay. So we have zero encumbrances. Great. Um, I do want to note too if I ran a purchase order detail. Um, and put in this, you know, if we ran it like for just for um, the specific account code so that we can see any outstanding POs in the current period, uh, it would be blank. Um, but that is another report where it would kind of like be impacted by this information. So, so this was full, but we clearly had money left to spend. So something comes up now in June and we're like, hey, we want to pay it on this PO because we had extra, we just closed it. So if we go to, let's go to the invoice. Okay, so here's our invoice and we'll go ahead and view this. I can see this was full, but I have this partial action button, but my date was in February. If I go ahead and click this button now, um, it will give me an error. It'll tell me you can't update this, February is closed, um, and it, and you basically you'd have to you know go decide then if um, you'd want to reopen the period uh, to be able to make this change, or you could create a new per, a new purchase order. Um, I do know that you know in that case, like if it was something that came in for the same vendor, you know, and they have to make a new purchase order, it might be a then and now, which. I know some districts, you know, um, want to avoid because I think that needs board approval. Um, you know, there's some other complications there. So um, that's a decision to make, you know, um, as far as what what may be better to do. And it may also depend on like what this data is, like how many periods back is it? Um, so let's go look at, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, open February. We're going to open February so that we can do this. So I'd come back here, open February, and then I kind of got a couple of transaction windows open here. So I'm gonna go back on this one. All right. So we have our 1200 here, but it's full. Let's go ahead, we'll make it partial. All right. Um, what does our purchase order look like? Purchase orders. Okay, I now have a remaining of 800. This is open. So I could go ahead and now invoice this and make my new payment on it. So as far as that part goes of just achieving the goal, being able to make another payment on this and reopen it up, that works. Um, however, Let's look at what else we did. Coming back over to my account page, gonna go ahead and refresh here. And let's grab this account again. And now I see this encumbered on here is 800, um, which makes sense because now our purchase order has 800 on it, but it previously was zero. Um, if I go 
and now run my budget summary report. That's gonna have 800. Now they're probably not running this report just for this one account. They're probably running it for all their accounts. So that's just adding 800 to my encumbrance simply by opening it. Now here's the thing. If I go ahead and run this, now I'm running it in June on my current period. If I were to run it on February or March or April or May, it's also going to add 800. Um, and I didn't, I guess I did have some other ones. Oh wait, because I had the 12, um, cause this is, um, looking back at February. Um, Hmm. I might need, I might, I might've had some other transactions involved in this one, <laughs> but they were closed in the current period. So sorry, that's not as clear to see, but it did add a, it would have added 800 for February, um, and March, uh, and April and May. So when we looked at our periods, we had, you know, March closed, but April, May were open, but generally like if they're in June, they might have all of those closed just because they went back and opened February and then reopened uh, this purchase order to pay more on it, those encumbrances that were outstanding now had to be outstanding at the end of February and every month in between. So just to go back to where we started here, in the case where they can retroactively run these reports, like I can go run a budget summary, you know, at any point in time and click as of March, and I can get that on the fly, this kind of um, processing with making the purchase orders full or partial to like reopen or close, it does impact those. So just kind of showing these things um, to kind of just explain why those periods need to be open. Um, again, it's not that it can't happen. You know, they could certainly choose to do this, but um, maybe depending even on how many months back, because um, if you're going to reopen it, one from February, you might want to regenerate those monthly reports with the correct encumbrance totals for February, March, April, or, you know, any periods that have been closed in between. Um, and that's why it may be easier in some cases to just make a new PO. So kind of just depends. Um, but those are the different pieces that are being impacted there. Uh, let's see, just checking my notes, make sure we covered everything in this conversation. If you all have any questions about this, please let me know. Okay. Um, the, I guess the other thing, the last thing I wanna mention on this and in showing this, um, especially, you know, I mean, most districts are over to redesign now and have been, but um, as they go, I think, you know, a process like this that is just different because of how the system works and some other um, functionality that it's giving you. I think that um, one of these things uh, is, is kind of considering their general practices and how that fits with how the system works. Because if you have a district that just kind of like uses full status just in case because they always could reopen them you know maybe now it's worth evaluating like when they're gonna just go ahead and um invoice is full versus invoicing is partial and then maybe revisiting closing later you know like if they're they have this um purchase order with a payment in february and they know they have 800 left like maybe in classic they always just would have used full so that they didn't have to like think about it later, but, you know, they knew that there was a chance they might get a payment later, but eh, it's no big deal. Well, now that we see that this is something that does kind of cause some, um, you know, additional consideration, if they get that follow-up payment, then at that point in time, when they're creating the original invoice, if they just used partial, it would just automatically include what needed to be included in, in their reports along the way. And that may be a very simple change, for them to make throughout the process. But I think as we go and as people continue to, you know, use redesign and get a couple years in here, um, evaluating those practices may make this a whole lot easier. Okay. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to talk about was um, closing a PO. So if there's a PO that's created in a prior uh, period with a remaining encumbrance, 
um, and they need to just simply close it. So if they were, so say they had a partial, um, they have a partial invoice. Now, if that's in the current period, like the very first example that we saw, they could just go ahead, change it from partial to full, close it and be done with it. And if that's in the current period, everything gets recorded appropriately, they're fine. Um, but if they had an outstanding uh, purchase order, it still had the remaining amount, but now um, that, was a, that was a couple months ago and in the current period, now they wanna go ahead and close it. The easiest way to do that is to go ahead and just make a cancel invoice. And um, I need to be on the purchase order grid. <laughs> uh, let's see, so, so if we view this one, so this one, it's from February and um, it was for $50. I have 50 remaining. Um, I can go ahead and invoice. And then put in an invoice number to cancel it. And then these item statuses, I have cancel full and I have cancel partial. And so if I wanted to close it out, I would just go ahead and choose cancel full. It can have this current date. And what that lets the system do is it basically allows it to say, okay, so the purchase order was created in February. The $50 was included in the remaining encumbrances on the reports for February, March, April, and May. And now I can use this date from this cancel invoice in June to say it should no longer be on the account or on the reports because this is when it was closed. So just to kind of highlight where these dates on these transactions, like how they're kind of used with the system and um, how it lets it track that. So yeah, so I could go ahead and, um, oops. So let me do this. I wanted to show you the statuses because there is the, the uh, cancel uh, partial there, but <laughs> I usually do it like this. You could of course type it in. I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, check the box and then do cancel and that'll populate the amount that I need. That's what I get for talking my way through it. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, that one's close. So that closes the purchase order out. Pretty straightforward there. Um, just to note, like the action, like, you know, you can't just use this action button to change like a cancel one to either like um, full or partial. So that doesn't come up very often, but just something to know. Um, okay, the other thing, so we'll notice like with this cancel that it, it, you know, it defaults the amount in there. I like doing it with the checkbox because it will default the amount that you need. I have seen some like odd POs. I mean, you could get the ones where it's zero remaining or even somewhere there's like, if it was, um, there's already been stuff paid on it, maybe even overpaid, like it'll put, it may put a negative in there sometimes, but what that's doing is it's getting it to zero. So this, the system will know, like if you do the cancel with the checkbox, it'll know what to populate in there to appropriately update the PO and make sure um, everything balances when it's closed. So that's a good trick. Okay. Um, so the other thing to note, let's go here. I'm gonna go look at a purchase order. Okay, so um, this PO has um, three line items. And uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and talk about um, overpayments on purchase orders. How, like a, an invoice that invoices above that line items remaining amount. So if we go ahead and invoice here, Okay, I'm going to do this in the current period. Um, and then let's take this first line and it's actually for 500, but let's invoice it for 1000. And We'll just do partial. Um, so I guess while we're here too, I'm kind of skip 
skipping ahead to let me uh let me let me slow down a little bit um on what what i'm um, going through here um we looked at this for a cancel invoice but now that we're actually creating an invoice let's just talk about um i want to talk about these total fields I'll, I'll hop up here and talk about some of these other fields in a, in a bit but um down here okay so i have my line number my quantity my original amount so this was the amount that the item was created for the remaining amount is going to be the remaining encumbrance specific to this line item. So this one originally was 500, remaining is 500. Nothing's been paid on any of these line items yet. So we have the totals here. Now, if something was paid on one of these items, you know, then we would be able to see that reflected in this remaining total. The payable, this is anything that's been invoiced but not actually been posted yet. So this is kind of like our filled total. And then, you know, description, amount, status. So I'm just going to go ahead and do this on the first line item. Let's go ahead and save that up. Okay, awesome. And what we did, we overpaid this. Now, you'll notice I saved that. Nothing really happened when I paid it for twice as much. There is an optional rule that can be enabled that would give a warning um, if an invoice or if an amount invoiced is greater than the remaining encumbrance. So um, again, that's uh, it's not enabled by default. So you'd have to go into the rules and um, turn that on. That is something that is mentioned in the FAQ for AP invoices. So if that's something that you're interested in, I believe there's a link right to the rules page from there um, that would give you more information about that, but I wanted to mention it. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about with this is we've had a couple questions uh, lately about how overpayments affect the total remaining, um, like the actual PO remaining encumbrance. And so what I want to do now that this is, um, you know, I've got the overpayment in there is I want to go back to the purchase order. Let's look at this. Actually, you know what? We may need to, uh, let's actually go ahead and post our payable, sorry. So the other thing to note is, you know, while these are kind of like in progress here, uh, you know, in the payable screen, the time between when uh, they're invoiced and then when they're actually posted to a disbursement. So when it's posted to a disbursement is when it actually goes to the accounts and posts the um, expense there. So it technically changes from an encumbrance to, um, to an expense when it's posted as a disbursement. So sometimes if you just have stuff like in this payable stage where it's been invoiced but not posted yet, that can show different ways on um, certain reports, which we have noted depending on the report. But um, you know, if there is something that may look kind of off with encumbrances and you know an invoice has been created, it may be worth noting like what stage of this process it is. So to actually just look at this as a payment, I'm gonna go ahead and post this one um, so that we know it's all the way through this expenditure process when we're looking at this PO. All right, so back to this, back to this. And let's look at this again. Okay, so now when we were looking at this before, our purchase order total is 2,154 and that is the item total that matches here of our original amount. I have a total paid of 1,000 because I went to this first line item and paid 1,000. But this remaining encumbrance, it's not direct math between these two fields. You know, it's showing 1,654. And I've had some questions come up recently that are, you know, basically like worried that something's wrong because like, hey, this total is not the difference here. And if the line items have are, are paid beyond the amount allocated for that line item, this remaining encumbrance will not be the direct math between these. Um, it will not be the direct difference because if we look at these line items, they're each for a different account code. 
So when we uh, when we said five hundred dollars is encumbered to this account code, um, as we saw in our prior example, that encumbrance directly impacts what shows on the account. Um, it impacts unencumbered balances. If I run a budget summary, it's going to impact that. And each of these different accounts is a different line, um, you know, on those reports. And um, so if I overpay on this first one, it's not going to impact what is remaining on these other two because basically it can't. Um, and I do know that there are cases where they might have multiple line items for the same account code, but that rule still stands. If they're encumbering on one line item, um, and then paying, you know, overpaying on another, it's not going to affect those individual ones. Um, so that is something to keep in mind as they're kind of going through and making payments. You know, some of these is probably pretty straightforward if it's like a supplies uh, PO or something like that. But sometimes they have ones that they kind of regularly pay on. I, I think construction ones, honestly, is one that I've seen it a lot because they have really big line items and they're just posting payments here and there and they, they continue to post to like one item, even though there might be multiple. So um, so I kind of just wanted to talk through that um, and show you know how that'll work. Now let's go ahead. I'm going to just click invoice here um, and show you this like remaining. So the other thing that happens here is um, I have my original, my remaining, I can see I still have the full remaining amount for two and three. And then it actually does show a negative 500 here just to indicate to me as I'm invoicing that this has already been overpaid by 500. So that's what that means when they see the negative there. That means this line has been overpaid by this amount. Okay, and then I did want to also, okay, let's go to our purchase order detail report. Um, Let me take this out. And I wanted to run a purchase order detail report um, for this one just to show um, how the remaining will look on here. So, you know, when we clicked invoice, it said, oh, you have negative 500 to indicate that it's been overpaid. But how this actually works on your reports and like the accounts is that it's zero remaining on this one. I mean, it was overpaid, but it's not actually gonna figure like a negative into what's remaining because these two lines still have that amount remaining. And then this justifies what that remaining amount is on my purchase order field. So that kind of gives you a good picture of what's being calculated within that. Okay, so the other thing that um, I, I have on my list next to talk about is these balance checking rules for invoices. So we are, and you'll notice, you know, I didn't have any balance checking happening as I was kind of going through my examples. Um, sometime last year, I think last summer, we, um, we want to add rules so that there can be balance checking at the invoice step. So when you're going from the purchase order to the invoice, and actually I think that might be why some of this confusion comes up with the like overpayments, um, or it may just be like a timing issue, uh, not issue necessarily, but like a timing thing where it would help whoever is invoicing to know, you know, if that invoice would um, go over where the current, um, where the current balance is and cause a negative um, a negative balance on that account. But so we have intention to add this. We did actually add some rules that were for this, but we discovered that they um, were not appropriately accounting for like the timing on encumbrances. Because again, the encumbrances don't actually get posted until they actually get, or so the um, expenditures get posted and then the encumbrances get removed at that step where it's posted to a disbursement. So it's difficult to do the rule because the account's actually taking into account that encumbrance still. Um, all that to say, these rules are not working as we intend them to right now. 
Um, so we had sent out an email, but I just want to make sure to mention it on here as well when we're talking about tips and tricks, because I know there's a lot that goes on. Um, but these rules, I would definitely recommend at this point that they're disabled. Um, we have a JIRA issue, and that's 4526, uh, USSR 4526, that we do plan to correct these so that in the future, um, it will be something that's able to do is have balance checking at the invoice step, but it's not ready just yet. So let me show you how to find these if you go into system rules. And okay, so I'm going to do it in this first column. I'm going to use my wild cards and do wild card invoice negative altogether, and then another wild card. So, what I'm looking for is basically the ones that have invoice negative, but then I have budget and cash. So, if I do an invoice negative, this will show me all of these. Um, there are rules for an error and a warning. I would double check the warning ones, are generally the ones that. I see as enabled, but none of these are mandatory. So all you'd need to do if you want to, um, like if you find a district has these on and you want to disable them, is just um, go ahead and edit the rule, uncheck this enabled box. And so you can do that for any that are enabled. And then once you do that, click activate and that'll update so that um, they're not getting warnings. Because right now those warnings really aren't um, accurate or meaning much. So if they have those turned on, I'd say it's just, you might as well turn them off because um, it's just another pop-up for them at that point um, since it's not checking appropriately. But yeah, and if you want, if that's something that um, you or your districts may be interested in, if you want to watch the JIRA issue, again, that is USSR 4526. All right. Um, so I have a couple more things here. The next thing that I want to talk about is invoicing for invoice, or I'm sorry, for inventory items. So now that we have our inventory software up and running, um, making sure that the invoices get appropriately flagged as invoice items so that they can pull into the pending items. Um, it is something that's come up and and it is something that um, I, I want to show you where it is, but we also have uh, something in the works for that as well. Now, when what I want to preface this with is what I'm about to show and uh, talk about here with flagging these invoice items is specific to invoicing in USAS. I know that there are um, districts that invoice through a third party and then it pushes over to USAS. So this configuration I'm gonna hop to does not apply for that. It only applies for the invoices created in USAS. However, I believe that the third parties do have um, like a way to flag these in their software. But if you have a district that's, that's not invoicing in USAS and invoicing through a different software, they just may, may need to check with them and uh, make sure you know that if they're gonna start using um, invoice, start using inventory and then um, have those invoices pull into pending, just make sure they're set up right. Um, in the inventory documentation for pending items, we have notes on this as well. So um, just something, you know, I know we're talking about a lot of different invoicing things today, but a um, little bit like related tangent there, if that's something that may be relevant to you, um, just kind of want to mention. So, okay, so let's go to our system configuration. We're getting a little bit inventory uh, setup related here, but um, this EIS Classic integration configuration, this is what came over from Classic, you know, or you can set it up now. Um, if the inventory module, if the EIS uh, integration module is um, enabled, then this will be here. And this basically gives a threshold and then it has this automatic checkbox. This gives a little bit more information. Like if this is checked, it'll automatically um, update for 600 level object codes. Um, you know, or unchecked, it'll prompt. So um, this is kind of just your setup. What um, I look at here mainly is this amount. So it's generally more than $50, but for the purpose of testing, this works. Um, 
And what that is being applied to is, let me get my purchase order. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and jump right to invoicing this one. So what this is being applied to is when I invoice, go ahead and add that, um, down here on my line item. So if I have my amount, let's, let's do it for a hundred. And then um, let's do a uh, partial here. And then now here's the thing, it really depends on your window size. So right now I'm extra zoomed in to make sure that you all can see this appropriately when you're looking at it through the little zoom window. But um, if I was zoomed out more, I may see these um, other columns, you know, just in my standard view, but I'm gonna go ahead and scroll over. But you know, if you do, if, if depending on screen sizes and um, like how your users may be looking at it, like this is, you know, important to note in case the scroll is needed. Um, but I have my account here, which is a 600 account. And then I have this inventory item checkbox for EIS. Now, I probably should have looked at this before I put in my amount. As soon as I put in my amount was 100, this actually kind of updated for a second here and it checked that box for me because it could see that it was 600 and it was over that threshold. So it automatically went ahead and checked this as an inventory item. Now, if there's like, you know, something else that they're invoicing that maybe doesn't meet those parameters, like they can manually um, update this box. I can uncheck it right now. I can recheck it. So this is something that you know, when they're invoicing, they can, um, you know, adjust it if they need to, they can use it, you know, even if it's different um, than those parameters. But, you know, in general, like, if I was just doing a normal one, even if I didn't look at that, like it did check it for me. So um, it kind of just depends on the situation. But um, what this does is this, this specific box actually flags this item in the background, it um, brings it over to kind of like a special um, like report object. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that it's a little bit different than that in like the tech aspect, but how I look at it <laughs> is it connects it to um, like an inventory item um, that we can, that can be grabbed and then pulled over um, into that inventory pending side. The thing is right now, how this works, this specific step is what flags it. After this is invoiced, you can't flag it later. Um, so this has to be marked here in order to have this specifically be flagged as an invoice item. So it's pretty important, um, especially, you know, once they start using, uh, you know, once if they're using the inventory application. Um, now I will say, uh, we've totally had some situations, especially with like, you know, I mentioned third parties, like there may be some different setup as far as like getting that flagged. Um, so we've had a couple situations reported where maybe not all of the right things got flagged and we have a JIRA issue for that as well. So I don't, um, I don't have that one um, written down in my notes, but uh, basically what we plan to do is make a way so that if there are missed items, um, they can be flagged retroactively, like based on an amount and um, an object number. So, you know, if you're hearing this and not really sure where like the districts might be at, whether they're invoicing in use as or in a third party, you know, and um, there's any concern for those items not being flagged appropriately, then um, that is something that we are planning to uh, have a solution for in the future. Okay. We are rolling right along. Any um any other questions on that? All right. Amanda. Yes. Um, could you please save this invoice and see if that EIS still shows up the next time you open it up? It will so you can't see it after after you save it. Okay. It does not show on here. So, um, and I, that's a good question. I'll show you where I can show you um, how I would go look and see if they're flagged. 
Um, but yeah, it after it's saved, it does not show on here. Um, my really my uh way to go see what was flagged. Um, my go-to is sorry for the scrolling. This inventory pending extract and like I can, I'm going to actually view this report definition because I'll show you kind of like where my thought process is on like how those get flagged as I was kind of mentioning. Um, sorry, it's just going to take a minute with the report definition. But yeah, so what this definition, what this report does, and you know, it's kind of funny because this report itself used to be used to like extract and then bring them into classic when they were still using classic EIS. Um, in the inventory documentation, we have a similar report that you could bring in that actually shows like the status and if it was um, like brought over into inventory or rejected or anything like that. So like that one, um, you know, has some notes related in the in the pending items uh, wiki page. So that may be like more appropriate to use if you're looking at all information. This is just my really quick way to kind of see you know, what got flagged. So when I open this up here, when we look at these reports, you know, they all have this reporting object that shows where the information is being pulled from. So like, you know, um, like my disbursement um, detail is coming from disbursement items, you know, but so this one is coming from an object that's called EIS pending transaction. So the ones that got flagged only will be included in this EIS pending transaction object in order to be included on reports. So if um, you need to check which ones got flagged, this report um, can be run and say, you know, we run this with a date. And I didn't necessarily need to open up the definition, but I wanted to show you this. Um, and basically what, what this is, is like, if it got flagged, it will be on this report as long as the date qualifies. If it, um, oops, pop, we're getting spoilers for uh, what's coming up. <laughs> but so um, if it got flagged, it will be on this. So here we go, invoice number, that's the one I just made, um, date, here's my amount. And so this is kind of just like an easy way to, to check which ones are flagged or not. But again, if it's not on here, then it didn't get flagged. Um, I think there's also a way with using like the advanced query where you could look it up um, that is in the, the um, inventory, like pending items documentation as well. But I kind of like this with the spreadsheet. So do it either way, depending on your preference. Okay, thanks for the question. It was a good one. All right, I'm gonna go back to, let's go to AP invoices again. And um, I don't have a specific one noted that I wanted to use for this. So we're just gonna go on the fly here. Just opening this up in edit view so that we can um, kind of see these fields better. but. What I want to talk about next is the dates that you are seeing on this invoice. And I apologize, I probably will go a little bit longer than an hour today. I'm just looking at the time and what I have left, um, but probably not too much longer uh, than an hour. So um, the, the thing that I want to talk about now is the dates. So this first date here, we'll notice that date, it defaulted to today. And that is what I would refer to as the invoice date. Um, when we were talking about changing the status, changing it from partial to full, this is the date that I'm going to look at is the invoice date. This is when the system's kind of like recording this transaction as happening on the system. When we looked at the activity ledger, it's the invoice date that is marked that we were seeing there in the first column on that activity ledger. So as far as like system purposes, you know, what posting period this is accounting for in, that all ties to this invoice date. The next one here is the vendor invoice date. This field is optional, um, but what this can be used for, so generally the districts, I believe they use this one for like, okay, I have my physical invoice, you know, I'm paying this to my vendor. When I have that physical piece of paper, what 
um, invoice date does the vendor have on here? And so they would track that. Um, this is a field for them to do so. The payment due date. So this one, um, what I believe, what I've pretty much seen this one used for is um, this can be used as like a way to group together the different um, invoices that there are um, making that they're creating into like a check run so if they put you know my payment due date so say i'm invoicing you know everything throughout this week and then um on friday so you know friday 6 10 so everything that i've invoiced this week i put the payment due date on 6 10 and now when i go into payables i can go ahead and select everything that has 6 10 and um, then put that in my check run so again, that one is optional as well. And then the created date. So um, obviously this one defaulted. This is, you know, my actual current date because I could change, you know, my invoice date if I, you know, still was maybe processing in May or, um, you know, I needed this to be in, in the May posting period, but my created date is going to always keep, you know, my true actual date that it was made. Okay, and then um, just to point out down here, I also have a received date on the line item. Now this one, so this is the this is the received date that you know you may have multiple line items down here um, on certain reports on the activity ledger. This received date is tied specifically to each line item. Now this can be manually entered, so you know, and I can even edit here when I'm in edit mode. Um, however, if I leave those blank when I save the invoice, it automatically defaults to be the same as my invoice date. Um, I have run into uh, some uh, districts, they want, depending on how they use these date fields and if they use these date fields, they actually want the receive date to be the vendor invoice date instead. So, um, you know, if they um, are putting in, you know, say they're invoicing now, but they had this stack of invoices and it has prior like vendor invoice dates, and then they may want this um, item to be associated with that instead, there is an optional rule that they can um, activate, that they can um, enable in order to have that happen so that when they type in, um, and I'm, I'm not creating one right now, it would happen if I leave this blank when it's created, you know, so if this is a different date, and then um, they were creating and they saved it, instead of using this date, it would use this date. And uh, I'll tell you why this is relevant. Um, where I see this come up the most is in relation to the accounts payable report. So let's go a couple places here. Um, go ahead and just go to our reports, our canned reports. Okay, so the account payable report, I'm not sure, if, I don't think this is like, you know, always, but um, I think some auditors may ask for this report. Uh, basically what they're looking for is um, generally what we get asked about is, um, they're looking for a list of invoices that happened like before the end of the fiscal year, but they weren't paid until after the fiscal year. So what this report does is that um, it generally defaults to 630 of the prior year. So say we're like, you know, in July, in August, um, this date along with the received date. So the received date is the one that's on those individual line items. Um, the received date entered an AP invoice and the payment date are used in determining um, what items will be reported. In this, com in this context, payment date equals when was the disbursement. So basically, let me give you the example is, you know, this invoice came in on uh, 628. So um, they went in and they had that invoice at the end of the fiscal year, but they didn't actually create the disbursement until the new fiscal year. So um, if you're in the software here, 
Wait a minute, I'm sorry, my windows got a little out of control here. So uh, let's see, let's go. Mm, no, it's fine, we'll just look at this one. So if you're in the software here, you know, that would mean that um, this received date down here would be prior to June 30th. Now, um, what I've seen happen is that when I'm like looking these up retroactively, maybe they put like a invoice date with the prior year in this vendor invoice date, but maybe they did actually create the invoice and let it default to June. Um, so in that case, they may have wanted this date to also populate down here. Honestly, this uh, tip and trick right here is one of the reasons that I wanted to have this training in June, because, you know, if this is something that, you know, maybe um, a report that they want to use or, and, and again, it depends on how they use their dates, because if they are actually putting the date, you know, that, that should be carried over in this one, depending on the timing of when they invoice, then this may be irrelevant for a district. But if they are using these vendor invoice dates, it may be, you know, worth um, investigating if, if they're wanting this rule. So uh, let me go to the rules. And, you know, I did not make myself a note on what this rule was called. I think we can find it. Here we go. So invoice modifies receive date to vendor invoice date. It's this one right here. And again, optional, it is not enabled by default, but if this is something that you have a district wanting to use, you could just go ahead, edit, click enable, and then um, once it's enabled, click activate. Okay. All right, so I really just have um, one more thing. So we're doing pretty good on time. We're better than I thought, actually. Uh, so the last thing I wanna talk about, let me go ahead and clean up some of my pages here just so we can get back. Uh, there we go, let's go back to the documentation. Uh, I'm gonna go back to transactions, AP invoices, and let's just uh, quickly talk about this a uh, invoice, uh, I'm sorry, um, importing AP invoices. And so this can be used, so this is a way that you can import AP invoices from a spreadsheet in CSV format. Uh, we do have, this is a template, uh, I'm sorry, um, down here is the criteria and this is a template containing the correct headings. So this import does rely on the headings. Um, the field names are not case sensitive, do not need to be in a specific order. Um, and this does specify the required fields. Uh, we have some notes here about, you know, if there are commas included, and then each of these different fields have some notes. So, you know, I mean, there are definitely different, you know, reports in the system where you could pull, you know, if you needed to pull PO information, or um, maybe they have a spreadsheet with some other information and then just need to add like, you know, invoice numbers and dates. But this was my little spoiler that popped up earlier is this is what the template looks like. And it's pretty straightforward. You know, a lot of this, it's it's all of the fields that we've been looking at this whole time on the invoices. Um, but what you would do, so you'd have the invoice number, date, again, this is the invoice date. This is that first field that's required. PO number, the item number, vendor number, amount, and status. Obviously, vendor number has to match the vendor on the PO unless it's a multi-vendor. Your status is going to be like your partial or full. And then, look at we have all of our little optional fields that we talked about here. So if they do have a vendor invoice date that they want to use, payment due date, here we go. This is where we say, okay, we're paying all of these on Friday. And then I'm just going to go ahead. Let's copy that. All right, we're, and I'm pushing the wrong button. All right, we're paying all of those on Friday. Perfect. And then I could put in a, a description, the receive date. This is going to be one line per, lot, per item number. So I could have my receive date. You know, I could enter that um, 
manually for each item or like if I wanted that to be the same as one of these other dates I could just kind of copy but you know if it's easier if they're making uh, or if they're you know invoicing in bulk especially in some situations where they might be like repetitive invoices uh, this could really come in handy um, to just be able to import them. So once they make their spreadsheet let's go back to our software here we come to AP invoices and I just have this import icon right on the top of the AP invoices grid. I click to import. I would have my file saved as a CSV and then I could just choose the file and load. This does work. I mean, we've looked at some other, um, you know, imports and other training. So I'm not going to like actually go through and load one, but it will show like at the bottom here um, if the you know, if how many were successful, if they were rejected, it will give you an error file that will uh, direct you to what might need to be changed. But um, yeah, so that is the import. I think, um, you know, that may be a convenient thing to use, uh, certainly depending on uh, the situation. I think I'm just double checking here, but yeah, that uh, that covers, um, the tips and tricks today, I do hope that kind of talking through some of this stuff, I mean, I know invoices are something that, you know, they use pretty regularly. So uh, some of this, I'm sure they totally have down, but just thinking about what it's doing, um, talk about some things that maybe, you know, some of those uh, different uh, fields that maybe aren't like talked about all the time. Um, I hope that kind of helps. And um, does anybody else have any other questions for today? Okay. Well, thank you all so much for coming and um, have a great weekend and we'll see you next time.